All right, so on to the next session. We will discuss about obstetric anesthesia as we mentioned in the morning before. Uh, we will have two speakers in this field. Uh, the first one is Professor Chan Yu Kwan from Malaysia, and the second one is Professor Alexia from Singapore. And for this session, I would like to invite Dr. Nopian to lead the discussion. Please, Dr. Nopian. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Krista, for having me in this session. All right, uh, as mentioned before, that today we are pleased to welcome Professor uh, Dr. Chan Yu Quinn from University of Malaya, Malaysia. And the second one is Professor Dr. Alexia Xiong Heng uh, from uh, Singapore. Both of them are big names in the world of anesthesia, especially, uh, especially in obstetric anesthesia. So I don't have to read their CVs anymore. <laughs> but first, I would like to say hi to uh, YK and Alex. Do you hear my voice Hello. clearly? Yes, very well. Thank yes, we much. can. Okay. How are you? We are fine. All right. Good. Uh, Raring to go. Have, all right. We have 30 minutes for the, each uh, presentation and uh, followed with Q&A session. <laughs> for the participant, uh, you may write down the question in the chat box. Uh, without further ado, YK, please. Okay. Thank you for the invitation, Susilo and team. And thank you as well for the introduction, Mr. Chairperson. And I shall now proceed to uh, share my screen. And we'll see how yeah. easy it can be. Um, is my screen actually being yes, seen? Already. It can be yeah, seen. All right, fantastic. All right. All right, good. Okay, um, as advertised, my presentation will be on obstetric anesthesiologists uh, as custodians of the fetus. I think we haven't seen your presentation. We see your screen, but you haven't opened your presentation. All right. Um, What about now? Yes. You yes. can see the screen yes. and you can see the presentation. Exactly. Thank you. That's the most difficult part in a virtual presentation. All right. So as I said, I'm going to be speaking on obstetric anesthesiologists as custodians of the fetus. And this is where I have been practicing for the last 30 odd years. And it is also where I have actually seen shifts in practice. And one of the shifts is actually moving into the domain of obstetrics, where we help the obstetrician look after the fetus. So I'm going to share this outline, which is, I'm going to tell you a very personal story uh, of myself as a mom, an elderly mom, and we are then going to explore our boundaries as obstetric anesthesiologists and look at how Virginia Edgar did it with pediatrics and move in the opposite direction into obstetrics as well. And I'll provide all the evidences I can lay my hands on. And then I'm going to move into this personal journey in God's path, but nothing religion here. It is just good oxygen delivery for the fetus. And then finally, we are going to look at competent care for mom, fetus, and the newborn, and how to meet their special needs. Okay, so how did I save my country 3 million ringgit? I'm, I'm sorry I didn't um, convert into rupiahs. I should have, but uh, you know, my maths is not very good when it comes to conversion because then you become a millionaire, even a billionaire in those terms. Anyway, as I said, with my second pregnancy, I had cervical incompetence and that threatened the delivery, uh, the, uh, the pregnancy at about 24 weeks. I needed almost two circlage and I was confined to bed for 12 weeks, but I finally delivered at 36 weeks. And in fact, if it wasn't for the special good care from this team that I was uh, allotted to, I would actually have inherited a premature baby at 24 weeks. And I knew at that stage that the, there's a 50% risk of that child being 
having handicap. In fact, that second child, if you want to know because of the good care, is today a doctor uh, practicing in Australia. And I finally found out as well from an Australian um, pediatrician that neonatal care to bring a premature baby with its attending complications to normal weight would have cost 1 million Australian dollars. That's how, if you translate it into ringgit, it would have been 3 million. And I saved the country 3 million by allowing myself to be managed by a good team. And that team in all of us who are working towards the needs of mom and the fetus, as well as the newborn, you will realize consists of an obstetrician, an anesthesiologist, and a pediatrician. While we actually, in the traditional sense, believe that this is where the whole team work with boundaries in between, we are now actually working towards a borderless team, a, a team that will provide borderless care. And, and I'm going to convince you that that's where we are now. And I wish I could also have convinced the judge. In fact, in one of those um, expert witness work where I was involved in, he actually made me very upset when he said, no, anesthesiologists are not required. They're only required during the delivery itself when the baby is about to come out. And I had a hard time convincing him, but I'm, I hope that today I won't have too much difficulty convincing you that that team has borderless boundaries and can provide good care, if not the best care, if that uh, boundary is borderless. Virginia Edgar, about 70 years ago, actually made her first foray into the pediatric side. And although she started her life as a surgeon or maybe an obstetrician, she finally, upon being advised, went into obstetric anesthesia. And that's when she made her, 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 her mark in our medical history by creating the EBGAR score. And in fact, if you look at what she has to say with her groundbreaking book, My Baby All Right, nobody, but nobody is going to stop breathing on me. So she believes that as an anesthesiologist, we have a right to foray into the pediatric scene and help babies breathe. So if any obstetrician tells, uh, sorry, if any pediatrician tells you it's my domain, you don't come into it, especially if that pediatrician is junior and doesn't know what he's doing, tell him that it was an obstetric anesthesiologist who made that pathway for him. And he has to recognize that that is accepted practice and has been for the last 70 years. And now we are going to actually introduce you all the evidences where we are actually making forays into obstetrics itself as an obstetric anesthesiologist. Pre-2000, um, you know, we had this division and into elective and emergency. And our description of emergency was actually quite nebulous. We use terms like okay, this is a dire emergency. In fact, the way we describe it, some of my nurses think of dire emergency as dying emergency. You know, dire is D-I-R-E. They listened and they found or they thought it was dying emergency, D-Y-I-N-G. So all these terms mean different things to different people. And of course, the yeah, reaction to when being told the kind of emergencies would mean how they interpret it. And it was Noala Lucas and her team of obstetric anesthesiologists in 2000 that made it very clear what we are actually talking about in terms of threat to the woman and the fetus life. So she made it so clear that we are now able to classify and categorize our emergency care into very strict boundaries and elicit the correct kind of care for our patients. But it took almost 10 years for the two colleges, the obstetric as well as the anesthesiology colleges to accept it 
as common practice. But once that practice was accepted, it opened the way for us to look at what we are actually doing in terms of care when um, we are delivering our emergencies. And you will find that once we are talking about category one or category two emergencies, we are actually looking at life threat, not to the mother, but most of the time to the fetus and huge percentage as well. And this is graphically what it looks like for those of us who can't appreciate numbers. So you can see that it is always the fetal life that is at risk when we talk about category one Caesar and that amounts to the whole three quarter almost of the frame. And we traditionally has been focusing on the mother's life. That's why we moved from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia. And that has actually seen a drop in terms of death and morbidity in the mom. While we actually have moved from general to regional, the same um, good benefit seems to have benefited the baby, but not as starkly as we feel it should. Because you would all agree that regional anesthesia can sometimes be a little bit slow in terms of us performing adequately enough for, our, uh, for the sake of the fetus. So what have we done in the meantime to correct that error? So as you can see, because we have actually moved from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia, we have definitely but surely lost skills with general anesthesia. But you know, as obstetric anesthesiologists, we have also um, the fetus in mind, as you can see, and we actually um, have gone into something that is um, very fetus um, mindful as well. You can see that um, although we have um, category one Caesar, the general anesthesia rate is not 100% because everybody assumes that general anesthesia is going to be more rapid than the use of regional anesthesia in getting the mother ready for the delivery. But you will see here, this is actually the practice in the United Kingdom. As the hospital gets larger, the practice seems to have changed away from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia as well for category one patient. So how did they do that? Well, there's such a thing called rapid sequence general anesthesia and there's also such a thing called rapid sequence spinal anesthesia. So if you look at the time for anesthesia and surgical readiness, you will find that we have adapted so well to this urgent requirement to have the baby delivered, especially category one patient, that using rapid sequence spinal anesthesia, we can almost get the patient ready for the surgery as well. In fact, at better times compared to our rapid sequence general anesthesia. Maybe because we have now in the last 20 odd years, since we have moved away from rapid sequence general anesthesia, our time here is kind of prolonged, but the rapid sequence spinal anesthesia, which is slightly modified from our usual spinal anesthesia, where we throw away some unnecessary practice to accommodate the speed. And we find that we, with rapid sequence spinal anesthesia, can accommodate the need of the fetus as well. And this is what the figure shows. And the EPGAR score from this um, data also shows that um, the EPGAR score is not affected too much. So what is the other, what's the downside then? Well, because of our shift away from general anesthesia to regional anesthesia, and even for, uh, for emergencies, we have actually moved away as well from uh, general anesthesia. The downside, of course, is there is more maternal nerve injury. All right, so we must be, well, that's uh, probably the subject of another discussion. We may have to look into this part of our problem. 
Obviously, since high risk obstetric clinics were started, we have been part and parcel of this team of um, providers who look into the risk of mothers, plus, of course, the unborn baby, all right? And in fact, many of the um, practices around the world have got high risk obstetric clinics or high risk obstetric um, multiple discipline discussions where patients as well as their unborn, the needs of their unborn fetuses are addressed by the whole team of obstetrician, pediatrician, and of course the obstetric anesthesiologist. And this is my own personal journey into advocating for good oxygen delivery in the fetus. All right, and I'm just very proud of the fact that at least I managed to get one publication in Lancet. No doubt it is in the form of a letter, but it is something that I actually felt so strongly about and I wanted them or I wanted providers to realize that, you know, we can actually do quite a lot in sustaining life in utero. If you look at the tissues of the fetus, you will find or you will realize that, you know, the tissues need energy as well as oxygen. And that oxygen is from the same plants that you and I have in our gardens. Except that to arrive at the tissue of the fetus, the journey is actually very much longer than to arrive at the tissue of the mom. So the mom is actually a conduit for the oxygen through which oxygen from the plants get into the placenta and then of course into the circulation of the fetus and ultimately into the tissue of the fetus. So that longer pathway, if you look at that data, uh, if, you, if you look at this data, you will find that longer pathway actually results in as many as about 3 million deaths globally every year of stillbirths. That means these babies, if they were delivered on time, after 28 weeks of gestation would have survived if care had been good. Um, and of course, about half a million mothers die globally again. All right, so that longer pathway has resulted in, in a lot of stillbirths and we must be mindful that there is a lot of gaps in care that we can help address. The oxygen delivery to the term fetus can actually be likened to the oxygen delivery that was needed by some of these uh, Thai boys um, during the very extraordinary cave rescue a few years back where they were caught in the cave with rising water um, in that um, cave itself and their oxygen, if not energy supply, was kind of um, diminishing by the hour. And of course, the whole world actually followed this episode with a bated breath. And ultimately, um, you know, if you think of that scenario, it is the same scenario actually that every baby at term goes through. Their oxygen delivery and their oxygen needs are usually um, very, uh, shall we say, uh, vulnerable to this kind of um, complete depletion. If the mother's supply is kind of depleted, especially where the placenta is concerned when it reaches 42 weeks of gestation. And if you remember as well, at the end of it all, when the boys were rescued, oxygen was kind of supplied to them. So when I look at this picture, it kind of reminds me of those fights that I sometimes have with the pediatrician, especially when they say, oh no, we won't give oxygen because of oxygen toxicity to the retina. And here you are dealing with a mom whose oxygen supply to the fetus is kind of low. And here you have to fight with the pediatrician to say, no, let this be an exception. And please, the baby is in need of oxygen. Just give the oxygen, breathe for the patient, uh, breathe for the baby, I mean, as Virginia Edgar 
would have said. So that would have actually, I'm sure in many instances, give the patient or rather the baby a good outlook in life instead of subjecting him to a lifetime of misery. And that's exactly the kind of care uh, I'm going to actually flag in this, again, a real case scenario, um, which I learned about in a case that I was dealing with. This particular Primi Gravida came from a peripheral hospital, was sent to a premier hospital in the, in the city. And that's because the uh, obstetrician felt that they could not provide the care that was needed. However, when the patient arrived in the city, the patient was kind of sent off in spite of the letter. And uh, the, 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 the story was the patient was not in labor. So finally, when the patient came again in labor, the patient was admitted, epidural was provided, but only intermittent CTG monitoring was uh, provided as well during the labor. And the baby was delivered when the uh, CTG indicated fetal bradycardia. And what was not good was a junior doctor attended to the newborn and faithfully recorded the EBGAR as two, three, and five. And on top of that, the cord blood pH, when I looked through the notes, was 6.8. The base excess was minus 17. And on top of that, the post-delivery ventilation in the pediatric ward showed a carbon dioxide level of less than 20. Of course, I made a comment on all these, and uh, I was also challenged again for um, why I made a comment on the post um, delivery ventilation of 20 millimeters of mercury. Well, difficult to explain to a judge when they don't know where our journey in care provision can extend into. Of course, the patient had, or the baby had hypoxic brain damage and uh, the case was brought to court against all the providers in the team. Well, if you think that that's an isolated story, it is actually not so. I myself personally have heard of a lot more. And in fact, in the United Kingdom, when they actually started this program in 2015, Ish Baby Counts, it all came about because before 2015, mothers who delivered in Shrewsbury and Nottingham actually had of um, babies who died very soon or within a week of the delivery because of the poor quality of care, both during the labor, maybe even during pregnancy, as well as around the period of delivery. And because of their persistence, the trust actually took it upon themselves to ask the senior midwife, donor, or Kendon to look into these 23 cases. When she started, it was 23 cases. By the time she finished and came up with a report in March last year, she had looked through 1,862 cases all in the United Kingdom. And if you note what she has actually to say in the final report, it's smacked of incompetence at best. That report actually came out in March 2021. So although there was this program to try to make care better for babies as well as for mom, so that they have babies that are intact, the final report says that those years did not bring down um, the numbers of brain damaged babies, stillbirths or early neonatal deaths. And what was more tragic was they said that if better care had prevailed, it could have changed the outcome for 74% of the term babies. So that's an incredible impact if they had provided good care. Look at the kind of care I received. 24 weeks, baby threatened to deliver 
And yet, even in a developing country like Malaysia, I actually had care that allowed the baby to go all the way to 36 weeks intact. And it saves so much in terms of heartaches for me, as well as so much for the country. Well, if you can understand that delivery is actually a very natural physiological process. And as obstetric anesthesiologists, in fact, all anesthesiologists, physiology is our forte. That process of helping to look after the needs of the fetus need not necessarily be so difficult. In fact, project to look after the fetus has now extended beyond the grounds of the United Kingdom. It has actually gone to Ireland as well. And I'm very sure there are many um, uh, care providers around the world that are taking up the challenge. And of course, as anesthesiologists, we are very much part of the team that should be providing that care. In fact, it is all a matter of listening to the mom and how she wants the needs to be met. In fact, they are part of the whole grand plan of good care. In fact, if you look at what she has to say, this is a very typical one. I didn't have a say in how I wish my birth would go. I felt like I was a number and it didn't matter. I felt the consultant team members were dismissive of my feelings regarding their choices for me. And I felt like I was a puppet with no voice. Going through the first pregnancy was scary enough without me being made to feel I had no control or say with anything that was to be done to my body. Communication needs to be improved greatly. A woman should be made to feel part of the whole process, not just an instrument in it. So for all of us providers, especially the junior ones, I always tell them, don't think you are doing good work just being a technical provider. You must submerge yourself into the whole grand plan of care and think of that particular mother and her fetus as somebody very close to you, if not a sister to you, and you would want a good outcome to accrue from that kind of care. And it is important to understand that one cannot do it alone. We need a whole overarching view of all providers to come into the team and have a helicopter view. All of us must have a helicopter view and not just a technical, small-sided view of what the patient needs. So we have to take into account the whole picture of what is needed. We must actually look at how to train our juniors in making good collective decision and not allow delays to occur and not allow, as in the scenario provided, junior providers who are not trained to contribute to poor outcome. So we must, or we may have to look at safety signs um, that is now uh, part and parcel of care provision. And if, the, if our obstetric colleagues are not up to it, we have to push this agenda through and look at team training um, for all, whether it is into the pediatric side, whether it is into the obstetric side. Well, sometimes I tell myself and I tell others, I am an armchair obstetrician. And it does matter, especially if the obstetrician uh, is junior and you need to actually get further help and every second counts and you making the correct helicopter view and getting the correct people or provider onto the scene can change the outlook of a poor uh, fetus into something better. So here are some of the practice points. Of course, teamwork is important and any deficiencies in any unit can be improved. And of course, we realize communication. Noala has actually already shown how to make effective communication by her categorization in 2000 on the emergencies. And we have to train everybody in the team to look at how we can contribute our individual care 
in a very well aligned uh, way so that no seconds are wasted or missed um, in, in this need to provide for the patients or the baby's needs. Of course, as I said, usually at this juncture, the baby's need or the fetus's needs are just oxygen and energy. So make this care woman-centered and of course, always be mindful of the fetus that's still inside um, the mom. So we've come a long way, 70 years, where we decided or where like the judge, we have this very segregated view of how care should be provided by the obstetrician, the anesthesiologist and the pediatrician. And Virginia Abgar showed it is okay to go into the pediatric side and now I'm actually going to tell you, we have already ventured, maybe you're not aware of it, into the obstetric side to advise, to support, to collaborate with all providers to make everybody's needs um, clearly uh, well thought out so that nobody is kind of left behind. Remember, we are dealing with two lives and doing something right for them is very important because it can mean a difference of a normal life or a life of misery for both mom and the child. So in summary, I would say competent care for mom, fetus and the newborn can save millions as I've shown. Virginia Abgar did it 70 years ago when she extended care into the pediatric side and um, she's shown that it's acceptable. And we have actually been making forays into the obstetric side to look into the mom's and fetus's needs and competent care for the whole team can make a huge difference where moms are being listened to and their needs plus that of the fetus are met every step of the way. And I'm gonna leave you with my email just in case you need to contact me for any reasons. And I would like again to thank Silo and the team for the honor of this invitation to share this talk with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for uh, YK for the wonderful presentation. And uh, we already had some question in Q&A chat box, but now we uh, move to the next presentation from Professor Alexia. Uh, you have 30 minutes for the presentation, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Indonesia. I really want to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, first and foremost, I would like also to thank the organizing committee for this uh, wonderful invitation. And uh, also want to heartily congratulate Cecilo and the team for so successfully organizing this meeting for the 19th time. And uh, well, I do miss uh, seeing everyone face to face, and, and I do hope that uh, in the near future, uh, we will be able to meet uh, uh, one another again, uh, hopefully uh, next year in Indo, Indo Anesthesia uh, number 20, right? Uh, but for today, I, I would just like to share a story about an accidental dural puncture um, that uh, resulted in a post dural puncture headache, uh, and a headache more for the patient as well as for everyone who, who cared for her. So nothing fancy. And, and I hope uh, that uh, the lessons that we learned from this case would be beneficial uh, to everyone. Um, first and foremost, my uh, disclosures, I, I do hold patents and uh, intellectual property in the field of obstetric anesthesia and, and uh, which have been licensed to commercial outfits. And I work as a senior consultant in the Department of Women's Anesthesia and, uh, and that's in Singapore. And, and uh, our institution is 160 years old. We started off as a uh, general hospital and then the, we became a maternity hospital. But 25 years ago, we, we moved to our new premises uh, and became uh, KK Women's and Children's Hospital, which is the only women's and children's hospital in Singapore. 
uh, we do about 12,000 deliveries uh, a year. And, and the case that I'm, I'm about to relate to you uh, happened uh, in the year that we moved to our new campus. And uh, this is how uh, the story goes, right? We had a 30 year old pregnant at term woman uh, with no previous medical problems. See, uh, she uh, presented in labor and requested for uh, intrapartum epidural analgesia. Uh, a trainee anesthetist uh, promptly attended to her and attempted the epidural, uh, but unfortunately it resulted in an accidental dural puncture. Right? The consultant uh, who was on call that day was immediately called upon and attempted the epidural at another interspace. And thankfully that was successful and uh, labor pain relief was satisfactory and the rest of uh, labor um, progressed uh, uneventfully. Uh, but the patient required cesarean delivery for um, poor progress of labor and, uh, and otherwise she delivered a, a healthy uh, neonate. However, on day two after delivery, this patient uh, developed a moderate uh, headache um, in the occipital and frontal areas and, and this was treated conservatively. Um, and uh, on day four, the headache became more severe and, and the headache was posture related. So a diagnosis of um, post puncture headache was made and, and a blood patch was offered, uh, was given, and, and this was done uh, with rather good relief uh, for, for the patient. However, on day six, the headache recurred. This time uh, it was moderate in severity, it was not posture related. And for reasons still not so clear to all of us, um, this patient was managed conservatively and was discharged. And by now I'm sure ladies and gentlemen, you would have guessed that uh, this wasn't gonna be a happy ending, right? Uh, and, and on day 14, uh, this patient represented uh, with a headache, um, much worsened, and, and this was associated with a change of sensorium. So at that time, a neurologist was uh, immediately consulted. Um, an MRI was uh, expeditiously done and that reviewed a left-sided subdural hematoma with midline shift. And um, the neurosurgeon was called upon and a surgical evacuation was promptly um, uh, effected. The patient subsequently recovered uh, with minimal um, neurological sequelae. She had to stay in the hospital for a couple more weeks, uh, but otherwise uh, she was relatively well. So obviously there were there are a few lessons to be learned, and um, one could argue that uh, there were quite a few opportunities for for the team to have um, reacted uh, to have intervened earlier, but unfortunately this uh, didn't happen. But of course, in retrospect, uh, hindsight uh, was very clear to us, but uh, moving ahead, you know, to have a good foresight, I think having an extra pair of eyes uh, is not enough. Uh, one would need to challenge existing mindsets as well as to uh, not take anything for granted um, because a danger could be lurking around the corner and could uh, catch us unawares as it did in this case. And one of the reasons why this had happened in our opinion is that uh, is because subdural hematoma after an accidental dural puncture is a very rare, uh, but of course it's a documented complication. And this happens because uh, intracranial hypotension that uh, results from the loss of cerebrospinal fluid and the loss of uh, buoyancy uh, ex would exacerbate the traction of bridging veins and tearing of the veins as a result hands bleeding and hematoma. And unfortunately, uh, a therapeutic blood patch may not uh, always prevent this uh, incidence. And with regard to the timing of presentations, uh, a subdural hematoma could present very early, i.e. within the first 24 hours after uh, the event of an accidental dural puncture, or it could present days later as it did um, perhaps in our case. And with regard to the outcomes, of course, uh, that would vary very considerably in accordance uh, with um, the speed of diagnosis, with um, 
the therapy provided as well as as well as the, the care given, and and um, and it could uh, result in uh, good outcomes, uh, as as it did in our case, or or unfortunately, if um, care uh, was delayed or or inappropriate uh, management uh, was effected, then uh, it could lead to fatality. Um, unfortunately, uh, subgeral hematoma isn't the only serious intracranial uh, complication that could arise as a result of an accidental dural puncture. A cerebral venous thrombosis is another serious condition that uh, uh, could be exacerbated uh, by uh, a sub, uh, an accidental dural puncture and, and the patients could uh, present as uh, with seizures, with, with headache, um, as well as uh, in coma. And, and uh, if inappropriately managed as well, um, cerebral venous thrombosis could also uh, lead to mortality. And indeed, in this EMBRACE report that was published several years ago, um, unexpected, uh, not unexpectedly, uh, thromboembolic disease, sepsis and hemorrhage were not uh, were the leading causes of uh, the direct maternal mortality. Uh, anesthesia, thankfully, um, and evidently here, uh, was not one of the leading culprits, but one could argue that uh, uh, one death is one too many. And, and notably, uh, in that report, uh, there were four cases directly, four cases of mortality directly attributed to anesthesia. Uh, two cases were due to um, general and respiratory complications as a result of uh, general anesthesia, actually at the reversal of anesthesia. And uh, very significantly, there were two cases of mortality after regional anesthesia and specifically after an accidental dural puncture. Uh, one uh, was because uh, of subgeral hematoma, uh, not unlike the case uh, I've just related to you. And the other one uh, was due to uh, cerebral sinus thrombosis, yet a, another, you know, very serious but rare complication as a result, intracranial complication as a result of an accidental dural puncture. And therefore, um, an accidental dural puncture is certainly not trivial. And uh, it is absolutely imperative that uh, we, we follow up these patients very mindfully and, and very carefully so that we are able to then um, pick up and diagnose uh, you know, complications as early as possible to um, prevent the down spiraling of events and to stop this adverse domino effect that could uh, potentially lead to very disastrous consequences. And, the key word is vigilance, right? And, and, and therefore the, the importance of being proactive and being very mindful and being very careful cannot be overemphasized. And, and this would include uh, perhaps uh, giving an epidural blood patch early, um, especially if the patients uh, present a very severe headache. Uh, as well as effecting an investigation such as a CT scan uh, so that we're able to pick up all these um, complications as early as possible so that uh, prom action and prom management could be effected and that has been shown to have a, a direct positive impact on the outcomes for these patients. And indeed in this uh, study um, that uh, look at the learning manuals, that look at learning manual skills in anesthesiology. Um, I'm referring to the paper on the top half of the slide. The authors generated learning curves for anesthetic procedures performed, and they found that epidural anesthesia was perhaps one of the most difficult procedures to perform. And this finding was corroborated by a subsequent study, uh, the bottom half of this uh, slide, uh, that essentially uh, tells us that um, one would need uh, to do about 30 to 50 procedures for a novice anesthetist to gain comp competency. So, so when I read this paper, I was quite concerned because uh, obviously uh, you could say that we potentially would be putting something like 30 to 50 patients in harm's way in order to train a competent anesthetist. And uh, is that... Uh, 
fair for the patient? Is that fair for the learner? Uh, as, as in the other forums that I've discussed this case, I will not answer this question and I'll leave you uh, to think about it. And therefore, um, in view of this, the role of uh, good supervision cannot be underestimated, right? And, and, and as a result, many institutions, including ours, have adopted what we call never first on the patient principle, meaning we would expose our learners and our trainees to uh, artificial models, to, to simulation before we allow them to touch a real patient. Of course, this cannot replace the role of a good supervisor, a good mentor, a good teacher, who is like the Superman, you know, who, who would be able to enhance um, the acquisition of skill and of knowledge and also to provide uh, the superior learning experience uh, for all our trainees and our learners in the, in the safest way possible. And therefore, as an obstetric anesthetist community, it's, it's, uh, it behooves us to continue to uh, create the environment of safety so that uh, we'll enable everyone to do the right thing, um, especially our learners and our trainees, um, as much as we can. But we have to admit that there are gaps in the way that we do uh, neuraxial blocks, particularly epidural blocks. Right? Many of us, myself included, we used uh, the so-called palpation technique to place an epidural. And, and that's essentially a blind technique. And we all know that uh, it's not terribly effective, especially uh, we, be due, we have to deal with uh, slightly heavier patients. Ultrasonography, of course, has been found to be a lot more reliable. Um, however, uh, it is only so if you know how to read and how to do an, an ultrasound of the back and, and uh, deciphering the images and the pixels can be very, very challenging. And I believe that's one of the reasons why it is not so commonly employed by our colleagues in doing uh, neuraxial blocks. And therefore, several years ago, uh, we sat down with our engineering colleagues right, to brainstorm. Right? We wanted to look at uh, how we are able to leverage ultrasonography to, to, to make you know, the performance of the neuraxial block more effective and more efficient. So essentially we have a situation where the solution, which is ultrasound, is, is more challenging perhaps you know, to master and to learn than the problem itself, which is uh, doing an epidural. Um, in short, uh, we want to look at whether we could um, perhaps democratize skill acquisitions um, so that uh, we'll be able to um, perform this uh, neuraxial block in a uh, more effective and more efficient manner. And, and uh, we, we came up with this a, uh, program, uh, and this was uh, subsequently published in an engineering journal, um, which is a fully automated ultrasound image processing system. Um, that, a, uh, that would enable a novice anesthetist or even a trained anesthetist to position the needle optimally at the point of entry, at the point of entry. And this, um, we hope our aim is so that uh, our anesthetists do not have to have an intimate knowledge of ultrasonography. And also, we also didn't want to over-engineer the solution. So, so no extra hardware will be needed, uh, just whatever, you know, uh, uh, we have uh, to, when we do an ultrasound of the back. And, and uh, by using this AI-based system, we were able to create a, a GUI or graphic user interface so that uh, it could then help and lead, you know, our anesthetist to put the needle in the correct place and, and at the same time conceal the intricacy of the algorithm so as to not to confuse our clinicians. And uh, we, we, we employed um, a technique called a support vector machine, which is a, 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 a modality of machine learning um, that would help to process, to extract, to match, and then to classify all these uh, images uh, in order to arrive at an automated ultrasound guidance software for needle insertion with the aim to optimize entry point and the depth of needle. We're happy that this concept was actually well received by the um, 
the ultrasound and the imaging community because we um, this paper was published in in the journal of ultrasound um, I, I have two very short video clips uh, that I would like to show you so please uh, do bear with me um, this is the uh, longitudinal view uh, of do it so the whole performance of uh, the epidural remains uh, sorry the ultrasound remains the same uh, and we do a longitudinal view uh, to detect the l34 level let's have a look at that again so we start at the sacrum uh, so importantly and very notably uh, this system allows us to identify the sacrum and therefore um, enables us to put the needle in the, the intended space uh, with quite uh, a strong uh, quite a good uh, margin of confidence and this is then immediately followed by a transverse, doing a transverse ultrasound, transverse, transverse view to identify uh, the midline, the point of insertion, and very importantly, to measure the depth um, of the epidural space. So we can have a look at that again, right? At the point where the skin was marked earlier, we would uh, look for the midline. and the depth of the epidural space. And that again is marked on the skin and the point of intersection would be the point of entry uh, for the needle. Our preliminary results um, involving about 150 uh, patients showed uh, a pretty good first pass, first pass or, or first attempt success of, of the, uh, the epidural insertion uh, with this uh, program. Um, in the normal weight patients, for example, we were able to achieve more than 90% uh, success rate for the first, uh, first attempt. And, and even for um, the slightly heavier patients, we were able to, um, we were able to uh, do that uh, effectively and safely uh, in comparison with, um, with uh, the palpation technique. And, and uh, in this uh, study, we found that the median time um, or, or, you know, the overall time that's needed to do this procedure uh, was uh, less than two minutes in the vast majority of the cases. And, and there was a, a very good correlation of depth from um, uh, in the as measured by the program in comparison with the actual epidural uh, depth uh, during the performance of the epidural block itself. Uh, but more importantly, we felt that uh, this could be a very important tool for us to learn ultrasonography on the fly. As you can see from the previous, the two video clips that I showed you earlier, all the structures were self-annotated, right? So, so one could uh, learn um, and, and hopefully become more proficient in ultrasonography as well as, as one employs this uh, program. Uh, we hope that it would be able to enhance skill acquisition, it would be able to ease learning curve, uh, reduce the training time, and importantly, the knowledge of the depth of the epidural space. Uh, we hope that would be able to uh, then obviate or, or at least reduce uh, the risk of an accidental dural puncture, so, so that an accidental dural puncture will no longer uh, be a rite of passage. I don't know about all of you, but to me, uh, I was told that it was a rite of passage. If you hadn't had an accidental dural puncture, then you haven't done enough. So, so, so we hope that that no longer will be the paradigm, and and uh, that accidental dural puncture uh, would forever be a preventable adverse event. But sometimes, in spite of best efforts, right, we accidents do happen, and 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 many of us would remember, you know, how it felt like, and, and how we felt like, and perhaps even looked like when we saw a, a gush of cerebrospinal fluid coming out from an epidural needle when we were attempting an epidural, telling us that we have had an accidental dural puncture, right? Um, so so I I. I I have no intent of going through all the strategies as well as uh, the treatment modalities, as well as prevention modalities of a, a post dural puncture headache. Uh, but it suffices to say that the first step is not to panic. And um, there's increasing evidence uh, to suggest that um, an insertion of an intrathecal catheter 
after an accidental dural puncture is beneficial. Of course, um, this didn't happen in, in the case that I uh, spoke to you about, but of course that could be a learning point uh, as well. Um, the, uh, some of the advantages of uh, putting in an intrathecal catheter would be its ability to provide immediate analgesia. So that, that's a lot of value for the patient, right? And, and uh, it also gives us the ability to rapidly extend the block for cesarean section if that's needed. And um, it might potentially reduce the risk of headache. Of course, this is uh, debatable, uh, but there's it will increasing evidence to suggest that uh, if placed for a prolonged period of time, i.e. about 24 hours, uh, the risk of uh, post puncture headache could be reduced uh, with the presence of an intrathecal catheter. But most importantly, I think it, it obviates the need, obviates the need for us to, to uh, do another epidural Right, which which happened in this case, but thankfully uh, that that uh, that was quite uneventful. But uh, there's always that risk of another accidental dural puncture. But of course, having a uh, intrathecal catheter in place is is not trivial. Right, we, we need to have good and safe um, protocols to 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 manage these uh, catheters. So uh, for that, I will refer you to this uh, paper that. Um, um, that was led by uh, Professor Sharon Zinger, and and uh, and which will talk about um, the steps that we need to take uh, in the event of uh, having an intrathecal catheter. So, so for those who are interested, uh, I strongly suggest that um, you make a reference to that uh, article. But ultimately, uh, as obstetric anesthetists, uh, our role is to solve our patients' problems, right? And, 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 I, and uh, that's why it's so important for us to, to continuously learn in our journey as we grow uh, as uh, practitioners in offsetting anesthesia. But I think it's even more important for us to learn from other people's mistakes. So, so I really sincerely hope that uh, what I've shared with you today has been beneficial, right? So, so with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. All right. Thank um, you so much, Alex. So right. um, I, I would like to submit to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, when it comes to an accidental dural puncture, prevention is better than cure. So, so the role of simulation, supervision, accreditation cannot be underestimated. Um, as a community, we must always find ways to make it easy, right, for all our staff to do the right thing. And that may include innovations or just simple process re-engineering. And last but not least, the role, you know, the importance of close follow-up and proactive treatment cannot be underestimated. So with that, I would like to thank all of you again for your wonderful uh, attention. And I really do sincerely hope to meet all of you again. And uh, hopefully next year at the 20th Indo-Anesthesia meeting. But, um, and I also want to take this opportunity to invite everyone uh, to the World Congress of Anesthesiologists, uh, which will be held in Singapore in the year 2024. I am absolutely confident that it will be a wonderful event and surely by then uh, we should be able to meet face to face. So with that, once again, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you very much. Back to you, Mr. Chen. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the wonderful presentation. And we move to the Q&A session. Uh, 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 for YK already answered most of the question, but uh, I would like to uh, read the good question, I thought, that uh, from YK, any suggestion for us working in rural area to get involved in this area? Uh, so I would like to know more about the tips and tricks to start this uh, good uh, uh, health care providers to uh, rural area in our countries. Please, YK. Sorry. Um, you already answered it in the Q&A, but I would like you to uh, reiterate again, is it? Or, read it again right. for the other participants so uh, it's more clear for us. 
All right, I, I'm, I'm trying to look at the question itself. Um, yeah, can I just get at the question? Because I think the, the screen doesn't show all the questions that I've answered. And um, I'm, Mr. Chairperson, can I actually yeah. get at those questions? Yes, again, this, uh, uh, yeah. Answer from YK, any suggestion for us working in the rural area to get involved in this area? Just like that. And Sorry, uh, which question again are you referring to? Um, Prof Nopian? Mm. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait. I think you have to scroll down a bit, uh, YK. Um, a bit. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the questions from, from oh, Ali the most at the yeah, yeah, and at 10 13, from YK, any suggestions for us working in the rural area to get all right? Involved? All right, yes, um, yeah, actually, it is probably not easy. You just have to make sure you can convince your obstetrician because, um, if you're going to look after the needs of the fetus, your obstetrician must be able to accept this new mindset. To them, you can be a challenge. In fact, I remember when I came back from Edinburgh in 86, we were probably, I would, I would probably say that we were not as progressive as we are now. We were a little bit backward still at that time in obstetric anesthesia care. And when we tried introducing regional anesthesia as the main focus, as well as trying to um, highlight that uh, we obstetric anesthesiologists can contribute to care, I think the obstetrician felt very threatened. They were so used to having general anesthesia that um, having regional anesthesia, they say they're not comfortable. It took me a long time together with my team to convince them that um, general anesthesia is not as safe as regional anesthesia for the obstetric patient. And so once you get over that barrier of convincing your obstetrician that we are all part of a very borderless team, if they can be convinced, the whole world can be convinced. The only person right. who cannot be convinced, of course, is the judge that I was alluding to. Not easy. He, they are actually set in that 70 years ago kind of mindset where we are just delivering technical care. But now... Everybody has become very modern and we realize that if you have um, a team that consists of progressive uh, thinking, obstetrician, pediatrician, who says we don't mind, whoever is good, whoever is there, provide that care. I'm sure you have many encounters with junior house officers looking after your newborn babies and because we are so good with our intubation as well as airway management, we take over. Sometimes not easy, especially when their egos are bruised. Okay, that's a uh, wonderful tips and tricks from uh, YK to all of us. And we have a question uh, to Alex. It's, um, with ERACs, we encourage patients to mobilize early in the post anesthesia care unit. Does this affect the possibility of having post op a headache? Because in Indonesia, we uh, start to um, erupt uh, massively now. Please. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for that uh, question. Um, so when we talk about post puncture headache, I think uh, there are two big groups. At, at least I'm sure there are many ways of classifying them. Uh, one is a result of intended spinal anesthesia. So, so uh, in those cases, I think it, uh, it would be wise to mobilize the patient. Uh, there should be no change uh, in, in the way we manage the patients because uh, the incidence of the post puncture headache, um, especially the small, um, so-called atraumatic needles, I think the risk is not high at all, but in the event of an accidental puncture, then I don't think it's that straightforward. We would need to uh, look at uh, the situation at the, as it arises. That's my opinion. Right, we could uh, be a bit more cautious, but I, but I think if the patient uh, responds well, uh, especially if they put in an intrathecal catheter, you know, and and uh, doesn't uh, complain of uh, any uh, symptoms, 
or, or science, very importantly, because uh, I didn't go through that in detail, but uh, there's another situation or another condition called post-fuel puncture syndrome, right? Apart from headache, you would also get other neurological deficits. So, so that would be a, uh, I guess, a surrogate of something more sinister. So, so we should be a bit more careful as far as that's concerned. So I don't think there's a quick and fast answer to that. Uh, and that's why vigilance close follow-up is so important in these cases. But uh, in the event that, um, Everything goes on smoothly, uh, which sometimes it, it does, but very often it may not. Then, then I don't think uh, there's a need to necessarily disrupt the care that we deliver. But if I may also uh, add on to the earlier question, um, also sorry, to, to attempt uh, to answer the earlier question, increasingly I think as um, practitioners, as patient uh, advocates for uh, good outcomes, uh, we, we must work very closely as. Um, what Michael Porter term as an integrated practice unit, right? As um, it, in, uh, especially in the very complicated cases, in which case, uh, apart from being interdisciplinary, we should practice transdisciplinarily. And that's a little bit uh, uh, akin to what the YK alluded to earlier. So, so um, the long and short of it is, I think, uh, instead of teams, uh, we should be thinking about um, this concept of teaming, right? Coming together, uh, we both, bring to the table our best skills and then look at how we could uh, work closely together. Um, and and uh, for, for, for a while, uh, we were thinking about um, a, a new paradigm uh, in terms of how we look at the obstetric patients. Right? Instead of viewing ourselves as anesthetists or, or maternal fetal experts, maybe we should come together and form a department of perinatal medicine, right? Because at the end of the day, it is about the patient Right, and, and we all need to learn from one another, one another. Very importantly, learn from the patient to look at how we can deliver the best outcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, can okay. I can oh. I can I raise an issue uh, with regards to this? Uh, um, you know, when to mobilize and 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 you know whether it will impact on um, the outcome. Yeah. You know, now that we are actually practicing errors and sending patients kind of um, quickly home. What happens if the post spinal dural puncture headache actually comes very much later? Because there was a suggestion when pencil points were brought into practice, they uh, there was one paper I can't remember the author now. Um, in in actually said that when you compare pencil point with a non pencil point, the headache seems to come say a week later. So a lot of these patients would have been discharged home. So I was just wondering if you actually send patients home early, especially with errors, do you advise them, please look out for the headache and do come back to our center if you do, because they might be taking Panadol, they might be seeking help elsewhere other than your, your obstetric unit and nobody other than obstetric providers will know about post dural puncture headaches. If I may respond to that, I totally agree with you, YK. Yes. I think uh, ERAS, to me, is not an event. Huh? It is a, a, a mindset, right? A, a change in the way that we, we, uh, we manage these patients for better patient outcomes. So, so um, okay, I don't want to belabor the point, but I believe uh, in the three Ds of management. The first is digitalization, right? With, with, um, with you know, the current advances and all that, we have the ability to do that. So in other words, uh, we could potentially transform the home to almost like a remote hospital. If we have monitoring, we are able to, we're not just talking about high tech, we are talking about high touch as well. Uh, are we able to uh, uh, ex exploit or, or leverage telehealth uh, to, to, for, for that? Second is about uh, decentralization, right? That's the second D. Um, increasingly, we want the best place for the patient, in my opinion, is home, right? Uh, that's where maybe, yes, maybe not, uh, the, the conditions may be conducive, but of course, there are always exceptions. Where, what works best for the patient? But after having said that, I think the caveat is that we have to be extremely mindful, right? So, so in the event, uh, we, the example given was an, uh, a, a spinal anesthesia, right? Uh, the 27G, uh, um, um, with a curl needle, of course, the risk of headache is very, very low, but it's there, right? So we need to be mindful about that and, and uh, have that communication. And third is the democratization of care, meaning the patients must be uh, aware of what 
is important to her. And, and that can only happen, uh, well, I think it's easier now than when I first started 20 years ago, right? People are more with Dr. Google, with all this kind of thing. I think that they're quite well informed, but sometimes misinformed as well. Uh, so, so it's imperative for us to, to establish that relationship. And then I think uh, the, at the end of the day, we just have to be um, uh, mindful that uh, every patient is slightly different. So, so, so it is not what we think uh, we want to do, but what do you think the patients deserve? I, I don't know whether that, uh, that makes sense to you. Thanks very much, Mr. Chen. All right, we have another good question to Alex. Uh, is there any alarm sign in terms of uh, post-op headache that when we should uh, order further diagnostic tests like MRI? What yeah. do you think about it? I think that's a very good question, you know. Uh, I, and I've been reading up a little bit on this in, pre in preparation for this talk. I think the practices do vary a little bit uh, according to uh, the type of hospitals, the, the social economic status of the, uh, of the community and all that. Uh, but the long and short of it, I think um, post dural puncture headache should be one of exclusion, right? Um, and, and it could be very classical, right? I mean, we, we, we have read in our textbooks, uh, you know, how it should be the position and, and things like that. Huh? But, uh, but we, we should never take anything for granted. I mean, that's the only thing I, I, I can offer, right? There are other things, meningitis, maybe something not even related to your procedure at all. And, and you certainly don't want to miss that because uh, I, I think I kind of like, uh, 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 you know, support what YK said. It's not what we do, but what the patients deserve, right? It could be something not even related, neurological damage, you know, after delivery may not be even be caused by, by you know, anesthetists. But if it happens, then we become, you know, a, a, a party that is there to hopefully offer some solutions. So, so, so um, we, is in the, uh, the diagnosis of exclusion and uh, we have to be mindful. So, so in the first, I think what happens in our institution is that uh, in the first day or so, uh, we watch the patients carefully and there are signs clearly suggestive of a post puncture headache. We want to do, uh, uh, to be mindful, to, to, to watch these patients carefully and maybe to do some other extra uh, investigations. But on the end, we, um, th there's increasing evidence suggests that a blood patch, uh, while it shouldn't be done prophylactically, but uh, we shouldn't delay it. Right? Uh, and if you think that that's, that's the, the cause, we could do that. Uh, and it is also a teranostic uh, uh, procedure, right? So, so if after a blood patch is not relieved and, and, and if the quality or the color of the, the headache uh, has shifted, then uh, I think we need to be very mindful and, and we need to get the whole team together and, and look at how we can best manage this patient for moving ahead. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the clear explanation from Alex, but I'm afraid that we are running out of time for this session. And uh, million thanks to YK and Alex. Uh, it's been a great discussion and I hope that we can meet offline in the next uh, Indo Anastasia event. Uh, once again, thank you very much to YK and Alex. We're back to Carissa. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nobian, for leading the session. Uh, thank you once again, uh, YK, Alex, hopefully next year, who knows, we can see each other in Indonesia. Uh, and I would like to appreciate nearly 700 participants this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> very well, Alex, I think you have, yes, thank you. Uh, Alex, I think you have so, some questions in the Q&A that you haven't yeah. addressed. If you want to answer it uh, on the Q&A, then that should be all right. I so, will try my best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it's Saturday, he has uh, time okay. for that. Well, I'll certainly answer the questions, but I hope the answers are correct. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Again. If they have many questions for us. Okay. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.